the luge run, which is this you know downhill track of solid ice. And these, did you see that event? I mean, the, 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 the skeleton board looks like, I mean, it looks like a baking pan, right? This little board, I put a helmet on, and they lie down on this thing, and they go down head first, their chin about this far off the ice. Right now, if you watch those people, what were you thinking? You're crazy. You're out of your mind, right? But we still watched them. It's like, oh, I can't believe they're doing this. Now, I'm not advocating that you take up the sport of skeleton, right? But assume for a second that, that you were going to, all right? So you go out and you get your, you get your baking pan, and you put on a little bicycle helmet, and, and you go out there to the top of the run, and, and you lie down on this thing, and you're looking down, and it, it appears to be going straight down, right? And, and your buddy is there to help you out, and give you the moral support, and also to, 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 to give you a mighty thrust uh, towards, uh, you know, towards, the, towards the earth. So you lie down on this thing, and, and there you go, you're on your way, and before you know it, you're going like a million miles an hour, and suddenly you realize that you are 100% committed now, right? <laughs> there is no turning back. And typically at that point in the process, there are two words that come to mind. What are they? <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> M stands for moment. <laughs> so my argument is... <laughs> my argument is that, that leadership is by its nature a scary endeavor. The OSM is an indicator that we're really doing it. There is no such thing as leadership without the OSM. So my argument is we need to pursue this, we need to pursue it in, in, in everything that we do. If we're not experiencing the OSM in the context of our work with some frequency, then we're just posing. So this is a way of proving it to ourselves that we're really doing it. Leadership should scare you. Launching a new initiative should scare you. Re trying to reinvent the way you work and reinvent your industry should scare you. If it doesn't, you're not doing it yet. Seek extreme food. Michael's organization kept coming out last, or second to last, in the company. And this is a guy who'd been working on his own leadership, actually working with the same model that we're talking about here for quite some time, and it was driving him crazy, because it didn't seem to be having an impact all the way down to the front line. So he finally had this epiphany. He said, you know, uh, my leadership is experienced mostly by the people that report to me. I must be, this is significant, I must be screwing up with the people that I'm leading. Whereas he could have said, the branch managers are screwing up in their branches, right? But that's not what he said. I must be screwing up. So here's what he did. Now, I'd like you to imagine this scenario from his point of view, right? He brings all of his direct reports together. So I think it was about 15, 20 people, something like that. Brings them in, you know, off-site kind of a thing. Brings them into a conference room, and he stands up in front of them, and he says, he says folks, uh, I'm screwing up. I need to know what I'm doing wrong. I want you guys to tell me what I need to do to improve as your leader. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave the room. Okay? And when I'm gone, I'd like you to talk about this. I'd like you to write on flip chart paper the things that I need to do to improve. And then when I come back, we'll talk them through. Now, and they looked at him very much the same way that you're looking at me right now. Uh, it kind of this deer in the headlights sort of look. So he left. Half an hour later, he comes back, knocks on the door. Boom, boom, boom. They said, we're not finished yet. <laughs> 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 so, so finally, uh, after about, I think it was an hour and 15 minutes or so, they let him back in the room. Now, here's the, I want you to imagine this from Michael's point of view, okay? He comes walking into the room. It's not a room quite this big, you know, a small conference room. He comes walking in, and the first thing he notices is that all the walls are covered in flip chart paper. List after list after list of things that he needs to do to improve. Now, the way he told me the story was, he said he knew that the way he responded in that instant would make or break the whole thing how he responded to that feedback. So he didn't defend, he didn't justify anything, he didn't make any excuses. All he did was ask a few more questions to get more clarity so he really understood it. They talked about it for another hour or so. The meeting was over, he goes back to work, and he told me that that night and the next couple of days were the most difficult of his whole career. He was devastated, as you can imagine, right? Uh, and he did start to get a couple calls the next day from some of the folks that were there saying, hey, you know, I thought I'd call and tell you some of the things you're doing well. <laughs> they, felt, they felt bad for him, you know, but, but, but he, hadn't, he hadn't asked for that, right? Now, here's, here's the, the moral of the story. There's a couple of morals to the story. Moral number one, the next round of employee opinion surveys that came out, uh, his group came out second from the top in the company. He had jumps of something like 80 to 90 percent in certain measures, and the reason was, as it turns out, without his even asking them to, his managers went back and did the same thing with their folks, and it just kind of rippled down through the organization, because that conversation 
was just as, if not more,